This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC and Jay-Z Microphones. So get ready to rock. If I'm recording and I want to, say, testing a an amp sim plugin, yes, I will go through. Even if the pedal is in bypass, I will go through a pedal first. It just seems to buffer the input into the DAW. If I'm going straight into a line input in, in my interface or on the console, I will always go through a pedal first. It just it seems to do something that makes it better. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. This episode is sponsored by OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and used Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac, the speed to create, the capacity to dream. Now find out how awesome your studio can be at OWC. This episode is sponsored by Jay-Z Microphones with a unique golden drop capsule design. The Vintage Series V67 and V11 microphones offer Class A discrete amplifier circuitry, extremely low self-noise, and advanced built-in shock mount technology to bring a rich, warm sound to your studio with crisp clarity and detail that will make you wish that you had discovered these mics a whole lot sooner. Go to jayzmic.com or click the link in the show notes below and use the limited time coupon ROCKS star right now to get 50% off their vintage series microphones. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is James Ivey, the technical editor of Pro Tools and production expert and owner and facilitator at Location Recordings in London, UK. James has been playing drums since the tender age of seven years old, performing his first paid gigs at age of eight. That's pretty amazing. From that moment on, there was no stopping him. His parents bought him his first four-track tape recorder, a Tascam Porta Studio 01, costing well over a thousand pounds. And Rockstars, that's more than a thousand dollars, just FYI. At the age of 12... Um, it gave him the bug for recording, and ever since then, he's been collecting and acquiring gear to make his studio and productions the best they can be. James' first job in the audio industry was with a pop video production company where he learned what the term deadline really means and other audio skills, which have stuck with him, like the importance of clock and sync. In fact, we were just talking about this before the podcast. And since then, he's worked for studio equipment suppliers and installers, as well as companies like Sibelius and later Avid as a production demonstrator. James, or Jivey as he's known in the industry, is officially the production expert gear junkie. If it makes a noise and you can play it or record it, he's interested. So I'm super excited to have James joining us today on the podcast to geek out about gear, drums, making records, and making cool stuff for YouTube. Please welcome James Ivey to Recording Studio Rockstars. James, are you ready to rock, dude? Born ready. Born ready. Well, you know what? If you weren't born ready, you were at least ready by the age six or seven, or clearly by your by your intro bio. Yeah, I've been making a lot of noise for a long time now. Some of it, hopefully, musical. Who knows? Uh, that's so cool, dude. I love hearing stories about people starting music at an early age. I think many of us start at an early age, but we can't always go back and say we picked up our instrument and stuck with it from that age. You know. I, so it's cool hearing hearing that you did that. Yeah, I mean, my my father is a musician and plays everything annoyingly well. Um, and drums is the only thing he doesn't play. So it, it seemed a fairly natural progression <laughs> for me to be the noisy one in the house. Um, I think later on, certainly by about age 13, 14, I picked up guitar and then bass and then 
someone in the band said we need a singer and nobody wanted to sing so i kind of put myself forward for that gig um yeah it, it's you know it's it's all about making a lot of noise and hopefully some of it being something that other people want to listen to as well yeah well uh drums are definitely a good match for kids for sure i'm thinking of the analogy if your dad was like a famous chef um and he was all about the cooking um assigning you drums I hope that's not like having you learn how to take the trash out for him right away and clean up all the dishes. <laughs> it was more, more like all in the family musical than that. Yeah, I think it was. I mean, I, I tried everything. You know, as a kid, I tried violin and trumpet and the kind of gone the whole classical route and just, just no. Um, yeah. But as a kid, my my thing, my absolute sort of love was big band jazz, and I know that I've kind of come full circle on that. Come back to it, but. You know, that was my the first thing, listening to Buddy Rich records and going, oh my God, there's, you know, there's something to this drumming lark. It's not just... There is something to, you know, this this art form that is drumming. And I think yeah, when people indeed. say, what do you do? I, I always say, first and foremost, I am a musician, I am a drummer. Um, not that I have to clarify those as two separate things, but first and foremost, I come to this whole gear lust and, you know, leds and lights and stuff as, as a musician as a drummer i think that's um very relevant i know it was the case for me uh watching your videos it's very clear to me that you're a whole lot more than a drummer um you've obviously learned how to play uh everything in the studio which is pretty awesome and fun to watch in your videos particularly um i also started out like you know suzuki violin when i was four years old and that lasted for a minute and then the violin got put away until i was in college and then i i pulled it back out again because I got interested and I built a pickup for it and people described the sound of my violin on stage a little bit like going to the dentist. So it took me, <laughs> it took me a lot longer to finally get a little bit better at it. Yeah. Violin is, is one of those instruments. I say my, my dad plays violin and I'm, um, anyone who's seen any of the stuff I've done with his quartet on the site will know, you know, he makes a good noise. He makes a violin sound like a violin. A lot of people don't. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, the thing that really got my attention, uh, obviously hitting the studio and beginning to grow an appreciation for a string section added to pop music or rock or whatever, all of a sudden classical might become intriguing again if it wasn't already for you. Um, but then also discovering old time music that really turned me on. There's something about like, you know, getting back to like, um, you know, uh, folk music from the UK, um, from, from that part of the world, there's something so, um, just right down to my roots that appeals to me about it. And there's also like a puzzle aspect to it that it's it's like sitting down to learn f and figure out a puzzle when you learn an old time song like that there, there i know it sounds incredibly cheesy tacky call it what you will but that but there's a duke ellington quote that goes there are two types of music good and the other one um <laughs> and, and you know i genuinely i believe that i mean in my cd collection yes i still listen to cds um there is everything from acdc to um zz top to Beethoven to Shostakovich to Buddy Rich to I'm trying to think of some more extremes of the alphabet but you know there's everything in there um stuff I listen to from its for its production value stuff that I listen to for its musicality stuff that I listen to just because I enjoy it you know um it's it's about the music and if it's good music then it's worth listening to or working on or working out i'm working with a guy at the moment where we're going through a whole back catalog of um 50s recordings and where they were just like kind of either um piano and vocal or just vocal and we're adding a modern rhythm section to it which is quite good fun because you know there's no click tracks to that stuff you have to play along and go with them and um learn the part learn the tempo changes which is quite quite good fun but a lot of it's quite challenging so you're taking the old recordings and overdubbing on them or you're just using them as sort of like the the guide track to recreate them no we're keeping the original vocal the original kind of piano um and then i'm just basically playing along and adding uh, modern bass modern drums sometimes guitars sometimes kind of uh, lap steel depending on what what the track is but it's all kind of 50s I, I suppose you call it 50s kind of pop doo-wop type stuff. It's very, very mm -hmm. cool, some of it. That sounds like super fun, man. But it's hard. It's really hard because you, to get it 
in the pocket. I'm so used to, so hopefully, you, you, you start a tempo and you finish the same tempo, or give or, give or take. Um, yeah. This isn't. This is, you've got to follow. You've got to follow where the guy's going and, and, and sit with it. So it's a different, I, different skill, but it's good fun. I, so I had the opportunity to produce um, Roscoe Gordon's last record. He was, he was actually one of the first guys to record for Sam Phillips and had hits in Memphis in the 50s. Um, and he was the creator of sort of the jump blues style. Mm -hmm. And when I recorded him, we recorded him live to dat. I just record him sort of doing things his way. And then I brought these back on ADETs. This is 25 years ago. Brought him back to Nashville. And then I found musicians that I liked. And, and one of the musicians was Ken Coomer, who played in Wilco for, for a number of years. He was a founding member of the band. And, um, and he was overdubbing drums to that same kind of thing. And he described it as like, at first he said it was a struggle to play to the recording where there was no click. And then he said, all of a sudden he realized he just had to get in Roscoe's head. Yeah. Totally. And once he did that. that, like he could play along with it. You yeah. Know? You, you, you realize that it, it's a, it's a totally live recording. It was, you know, someone put a mic up in a room with a piano and they, and they sang and played along and that's what you got. And the, the tempo pushes and pulls are the natural kind of feel and groove of the music, which is great. Yeah. Well, so tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, coming up through, uh, you know, I don't know, to your first professional time doing music. Well, I guess your first professional was at eight. But I mean, you know, you were, did you go to school and study drums? Did you study music and go through a, um, a path like that at all? I had lessons as a kid um, with like the local, the local pros and then worked my way up to some of the, some of the London guys. I was living... Um, I grew up in a town called Ipswich, which is about 90 miles northeast of London. Um, so got to a certain stage where, you know, I was I was one of the local gigging pros, um, even though I was still at school and didn't have a driving license, you know, minor issues for a drummer. Right. Um, that's what dad's taxi was to me. Some people go to soccer practice, some people go to, you know, baseball, basketball, whatever. Mine was rehearsals. <laughs> Um, yeah. so started having lessons in London, realized that I think all the way through my education up to about 16 years old, there was this fight between, I'm quite arty. I'm quite a kind of graphically driven person as well as audio Lee, if that's a real word. Mm -hmm. Um, it is now it is now. Yeah. I've just coined it. Um, and there was always this side of me that said, look, keep music as a hobby, you'll never make any money. And that, that young me was quite smart. Um, and I got to 16 and I thought, Do you know what? It's not, there's no point in fighting it. I'm going to be something in the music industry. I'm going to do um, something to do with music. Um, it's going to be my life. It's a huge part of what I was even then, you know, planning bands and gigs and stuff as a 16 year old. And so I sort of embraced it and did... Um, a levels in the UK, which is kind of, I don't know what the equivalent in the States is, but it's kind of 17, 18 year olds. And then went off to university at uh, 18 um, to do music and instrument technology, which is kind of a hybrid between the studio thing and the music thing. So we got oh, to play cool. in studios and build instruments and work in studios and um, do the whole music tech thing as well, which was great. That's brilliant. That's really, uh, it sounds like a smart way to do it. I mean, it's quite a lot to bite off and chew. But if you think about learning how to record, then you think about, well, you know, I better know the technical side of this. And then you start having conversations about, you know, hey, why don't you build a microphone? Why don't you build a mic preamp so I understand how these things work? Then you take that a step further and you're like, well, why don't you build the instrument? <laughs> so you know yeah, we did, how to make things sound good. We did elements of kind of electronics and acoustics and um, kind of uh, music, music history, musical instrument history. It was a really, really varied course. Obviously, you, by the time you got to the second and third year, you could kind of go where you wanted to go and um, focus a bit more on, you know, either practical instrument making or working in the studio or sort of hardcore electronics. We had one guy built a console, built a, a full 24-track wow. console. As, as was his name G. Parnett? <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> um, we were very lucky at that school. We had... Um, a guy called Sam Verrick, who was one of the lead engineers with SSL, 
in the eighties. So oh, wow. that was he, he was a mine of of um, useful information that was quite handy. Um, but we had lots of really cool, uh, very hands on tutors. It wasn't all about it wasn't all um, theory and blackboards and whiteboards and you know, sat in the classroom. It was very hands on and actually get on and do stuff. Um, and that kind of grew into jobs and careers and stuff. Which, you know, and the last thing I ever thought I'd be would, it still makes me laugh. I go to the NAM show and, and I get a badge that says media or press on it. I'm like, if you'd said to any of my um, teachers as a 14 year old that I was going to be a journalist, they'd have laughed me out of school. <laughs> you know, um, I think, well, I, I think same thing goes for me. Although one of the things that I did early on was drive around with a studio on the back of a car with a, um, the singer in my band. Once our band broke up and we didn't want to stop recording and making music and we would just go around like capturing people's stories and songs. And honestly, this feels like an extension of that. It's, it's capturing, you know, your story and the story of all the guests on the show. Um, but you know, another thought about the school thing is when I went to school, it was about it was about electronics, it was about cabling, it was about understanding the basics of audio and a tape machine. And there was this new thing coming along called computers. Um, but if you wanted to get a little deeper, you could learn, like I said, the electronics and and maybe how a mic pre worked. And now I'm I'm having interns in who are able to take classes in school that teach them how to design plugins and DSP stuff. And I just think that's really fascinating, you know. They get deep into the computerized side of making music. Yeah, going too deep like that scares me a little bit. I'm certainly not a code junkie. Um, I, I, I understand there are people out there who are smarter than I. <laughs> <laughs> I. I know for a fact there are people out there smarter than I. Um, well, Groovy, all right, so uh, let's jump forward a little bit. Uh, you... You know, got out of school, you've you've got a studio of your own called Location Recording, and you have been working with, uh, now I called it Pro Tools slash Production Expert. Um, is that all one and the same? Is it is it two different brands? Am I getting it right or wrong? Production Expert is the overarching kind of the family, if you like. We're the production expert sites or the production, the expert sites. Um, it started as just Pro Tools Expert uh, just over 10 years ago. Uh, and I've been involved for seven of those, I think. Um, I Groovy. met Russ, the the founder, um, while we were both freelancing for Avid, um, and yeah, got on really well. And the the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> Indeed. Well, um, rock stars, if you're not familiar with Production Expert or Pro Tools Expert yet, and I'm guessing you probably are, it is a great resource for learning. Um, everything about making records, pretty much, right? Yeah, I mean, we it started off very Pro Tools centric um, because there was no, um, you know, th there were no tutorials for some of the the virtual instruments that Avid had introduced, and Russ thought it's all very well saying why are there none? It was more I'll do some then. So um, it's always been very Pro Tools focused. I came along with a bit more of a kind of, well, we can we can do this about microphones and monitors and kind of other hardware -y type stuff, and because that's where my, I think that's where my passion lies. I'm not really a plugins guy. I, I like hardware. Mm -hmm. I say I'm sat in my studio right now and I've got sort of racks of the stuff everywhere, and I, I'm definitely a old school methodologies with modern tech, if that makes sense. I think I like to yeah. bring the best of both worlds into it. Um, um, and so I started doing a lot more of the kind of hardware stuff, got into microphones. Microphones have been my catnip forever. And yeah, it's, it's grown into the Leviathan it is now. We've got five sites covering um, Studio uh, Studio One, Pro Tools, Logic, uh, product, general production stuff. Uh, it's growing all the time. Uh, the team is growing. We, we've got people in North America, Canada, uh, the UK is primarily where we're all based. Um, Russ is in Northern Ireland. Uh, yeah, so it's it's very very cool. A great group of people, but we're hope, hope, hopefully producing stuff that you out there, the consumer, the 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 audience, if you like, is enjoying. 
That's great. I, I like hearing you talk about Pro Tools Expert being the first one. You guys were niching down before niching down was even a thing on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but the, but that's awesome. So uh, a, a question that pops to mind for you, me when I think about you guys creating all this content on all these different platforms is uh, how you know how do you know what people want to learn about? Um, how do you connect with people to make sure that you're making content that is really helping everybody? I think back at the beginning, it was, well, I don't know that. I'll find out. I'll, I'll, I'll share that knowledge. It, it was literally that simple. I've worked it out. If I've got to work it out, I'm fairly sure that someone else will have wanted to work it out. Let's make a video. Um, a lot of what I do is kind of, we call them reviews, not reviews, because these days, the world and his auntie is getting hold of gear and putting out a, a review video. My thing is all about showing the gear being used in real, in a real, a real scenario, if you like, being using yeah. it in, in a, um, if, if someone sent me a microphone, I'm going to record some stuff with that microphone and you can hear it. If I'm playing with an audio interface, I'm going to track a band with it. I'm, I'm sorry, working on an, um, an edit for a video right now for a piece. And it's all about using it for real. There's no point in me sat there in front of a camera talking about a thing. People want to hear it. They want to see it. Maybe they're not um, close to a half-decent music store. Sadly, there aren't that many left in, certainly mm. not in London. I don't know what, what um, the US is like these days other than the big sort of three. But there used to be the very knowledgeable local music shop, and those are sadly um, are vanishing if they if not already vanished. So well, now so if, if you go in place, if you like, it, it, sorry, if you go into the big one, I, I can tell you what you're probably going to hear. It probably sounds like a hundred guitars going, doodly, 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 you know, yeah, just which like makes it kind of hear the, the hard to hear the problem. go to the wrong hall in the Nam show. Yeah, that's exactly what you hear. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, we're, we're just trying to be, you know, the the voice of uh, mediocrity, the voice of reason, the voice of the. You know, I'm I'm a I'm a gear junkie. I absolutely admit it. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to degrade myself. But in that, I love toys. I love instruments. I love surrounding myself with uh, surrounding myself with equipment that can help me tell a story. Can help me tell that story better because yeah. that's really what music is. Or say what it is to me. It's about telling a story, whether it's telling it verbally with lyrics or whether it's telling it with a melody or whatever, with interesting harmony, with a really cool rhythm. Rhythm is what excites me. I think that's a drum thing. Um, an interesting rhythm and a cool pattern, a cool groove will excite me much more than someone going widdly, 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 widdly on a guitar. <laughs> well, you know, if you're a guitar player, maybe you'd feel different, but no, I'm with you. I, I love having good rhythm in a track and I'm, I'm immediately drawn to that. But also I want to, I want to give us all a little permission to enjoy gear and toys in the studio. I think sometimes we, the story is so common to, um, you know, argue against the gear um, or against getting toys. But honestly, there's nothing wrong with that. Enjoy it. I mean, we're here to make music and be in studios and, and having fun gear to play with, like their toys and just extending our childhood all the way into forever is a perfectly laudable pursuit, I think. I am... I am the when people say, oh, don't go into debt for, for gear. That is a very good piece of advice. Um, but my view is, you know, it's it's my hobby as well as my job. Well, I don't go out drinking seven nights a week, six nights a week and, and get smashed. I, I never have been that person because there's always been a car to fill up with petrol to go to the next gig or whatever. Um, I'm lucky now that my studio is based on my own property so my commute to work is significantly shorter than a great many people's. Um, yeah. I, my thing is, is my studio. My, it's, it's my passion in life. It's my, my other thing. My kids, my wife and my studio. Um, yeah, I probably agree in that order as well. <laughs> nice. Well, I was going to comment on something else you said too. You're talking about making the videos um, and, and doing this with Russ. And you guys start out by just, you know, answering the questions that you have. And when you figure out how to do it, you share the knowledge and how uh, everybody and their aunt are making videos. So a funny anecdote for me is my beginning of stepping into, you know, venturing into making some videos on YouTube 
one of the first videos I thought I would make is I was like, oh yeah, why don't I make a video about um, how to do a hack where you can create uh, presets for tracks in Pro Tools in Pro Tools 11, which was new at the time. And I had just learned that because somebody shared a video not too long ago um, that taught me that trick. And I was like, oh, cool. So so I made the video and I put it out there and I kind of forgotten the source for it until somebody came in to comment on YouTube and there was like, they were like, Hey man, you just, you just got this from pro tools expert, man. This is, <laughs> you didn't make this up. And I was like, I was like, you're absolutely right. Thanks for <laughs> reminding me. And, and thank you to pro tools expert for teaching me that trick. <laughs> the funny thing is though, say we've, I, I was looking across YouTube and there's like over a thousand videos there. Um, and and those are the ones that we put in on YouTube. They don't all live there. And sometimes you'll do a tutorial and you go, this, I, I remember this. Why do I remember this? And then you go digging and you realize you made it two years before. Um, so I don't, I don't right. think there's any problem with, with duplication sometimes if you come at it from a different angle. Uh, but yeah, it, it can be, you go, Oh, I, I, I can't do that because that's just gone out on XYZ site. We've both been working on it on the same time. Or two of the guys on the team will work on the same thing at the same time, which is just hilarious. Oh, that, that's got to be a little bit um, uh, comical and, and frustrating at the same yeah, time. You, you flip a coin for whose version goes live. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing I will encourage everybody on, though, is um, it's, uh, it's that uh, re reminder to don't let imposter syndrome get in your way. So, for example... Just like there's somebody out there who's making a great rock record right now, that shouldn't stop you from wanting to make one um, because the one thing you always bring to the table is your own unique personality. And I think that goes for tutorial videos as well. You know, just because somebody else is teaching a way to get a great vocal sound, if you, if you want to make a video about it and teach people, just go ahead and do it because your take will be a little different. Absolutely. I mean, um, we've even said, you know, on the site that the way I do something versus the way Russ does something, you know, we're going to come at it from a very different angle. It, the subject itself might be the same. The outcome may be the same. It won't be. But the fact that you've got two different journeys, two different paths to get there is relevant. Um, we, we probably yeah. wouldn't put those out in the same week, but you know, it's totally relevant. It's totally relevant content. This show is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can go to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level. And you can start right now with my free introduction to mixing course, Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is that these mixing techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you are in Logic, Cubase, PreSonus Studio One, Reaper, or anything you can think of. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix masterbundle.com to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode if you don't mind let's continue to geek out on this content creation thing just just for a moment because i do think it's an important part of uh being a creator now even if you're just making music the understanding of you know the power of having a youtube channel connected to what you do or or, or creating video content or just simply sharing and teaching what you've learned because that is how we we um keep the momentum going for this wonderful thing called you know recording music um and, and so many of us are trying to figure out how to understand creating video a little bit more um so if you don't mind i might ask you a couple of questions about that go for it Dive um in. <laughs> okay so and they're they're pretty geeky but uh one of the things I wanted to ask you is, uh, so you have some wonderful videos of you recording songs in your studios. You had one that was, uh, and, and Rockstars, I included these in a YouTube playlist in the in the show notes. So you can just click through and watch James's videos, uh, or Jivey's videos. But um, one of them was a song called Damned If I Do. And then you also did a cover of Toto's Rosanna. Yep. Um, that were both super cool. And it's... It's just a perfect example of what uh, so many people should be doing if they've got a studio, which is recording the music, but also making a cool video to show how you're recording it. Show yourself in the studio recording on your instrument so that 
people know what you sound like and want to come work with you. Um, when you're shooting video of the music being recorded, what are some smart lessons you learned about capturing the video easily and also like somehow keeping it in sync later with the final mix of the song or, or you know, however you're creating this music plus video? Um, oh, it's, it's funny because a lot of that stuff, um, certainly down if I do the Alan Parsons track and Rosanna, which is my favorite song in the world to the point where it's my daughter's middle name. You know, I couldn't, get, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't get Rosanna in as a first name, but um, it, they were actually done as learning projects for me because I, at the time, was working for Avid and I was doing events like the NAMM show. And I was, I was wanting to demonstrate running Media Composer, which is Avid's video um, editing platform, and Pro Tools in sync. And I thought, well, I could get the stock footage from, you know, Captain Avid and just say, I'll run something. And I think, no, that, that, that's rubbish. That's what, that's what somebody else would do. I'm going to track something and I'm going to work it out and I'll go through and I'll record everything and I'll video myself doing it. And Colin McDowell and I, um, Colin from McDSP, and I always have a joke whenever I see him. He goes, hey, it's the Rosanna guy, because I was stood opposite him for four days at a NAMM show, and every nine, ten minutes he would get, all I want to do when I wake up in the morning, and <laughs> just drove him insane. So, yeah, if you do see Colin, just But he never got out. sick of your... He never got sick of your drum groove, though, right? No, hopefully not. Um, so if you do see Colin, just just say hi and sing Rosanna at him. Um, <laughs> so it's it started like that. It started as a. I, also, I wanted to learn Media Composer and I wanted to learn these edit, video editing platforms. So I recorded a track, and then it became to the point got to the point where every year for the Nam show, I needed to have a new track. So I I pulled a few people in. I did another one with. Um, uh, an old Blood, Sweat and Tears track called um, Spinning Wheel with um, a brass oh, section nice. that I know. And that went really well. And, and it's, it's, every every sort of couple of three years, I do another one of these epic um, Uber recording things with a load of video. Um, but getting back to your question, um, one of the things I learned early on is you cannot be both sides of the camera. So yeah. don't don't try and get a camera that is too complicated. I started off with camcorders, and to be honest, I'm going back to camcorders. Um, I used to have an assistant for a little while, for about a year. Um, she was great because she also knew cameras as well as um, audio. But it's very difficult being a self-shooter on a DSLR where you're trying to keep manual focus and all these boring things. Camcorders are the way forward. Yes, you do sacrifice a little bit in the sort of color richness that DSLRs can give you. Um, but the hassle is just not worth it. Get yourself, um, and this is the big one, get yourself two good DSLRs. Uh, sorry, get yourself two good camcorders. And the reason I say two is because when you mess up, and you will, you've got a shot to cut back to. Yeah. You've always got a second angle. Um, that's one of my, been one of my big things. People go, oh, why would you shoot two cameras? It must take you twice as long to edit. Yes, it does take longer to edit, but I'm actually filming for a lot less time because I know if I've messed up, I just roll back and I've got the second angle I can cut to and make it look like I, it was an editing decision. There, yeah, there, you know, there's, the, there's the biggest giveaway of all my <laughs> video workflow. <laughs> learning to edit video is really fascinating and it's been a lot of fun. And you learn all these tricks. Like um, a lot of times when the edits happen, once you've learned this stuff, you watch something and when an edit happens, you go, oh, they just stumbled on a word there and they needed to edit the audio underneath. And that's why they jumped to B-roll, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And it's pretty, pretty amazing. So camcorders are something that you recommend um, have you experimented with just like, you know, should, should the rock stars try, should they invest in a camcorder now or can they get some headway out of just using an iPhone and stuff oh, like that to start? I, I, iPhone camera is awesome. But again, uh, the, the, the downside of using an iPhone is you can't see the screen on the other side. You can't frame a shot properly. Uh, whereas uh. most camcorders, they have a flip around screen. Yes, I'm sure you can get adapters and all that soft stuff for iPhones. Um, the other thing I don't like about iPhone is 
I, a the media format is quite odd. Um, I think iPhones record at some very very bizarre frame rate. Not to get too technical, that's quite important for sync later on. And yeah. how do you see it? You've got to ha then have another adapter and another little thing stuck on a tripod, and it's just a bit messy. Whereas a half decent camcorder these days might cost you 600 quid um someone else will have to do the conversion into um, us dollars um i just i've just upgraded to a really really nice sony it's basically the lowest end broadcast 4k camcorder um it's the last one with a fixed lens before you can take them all off and get into you know other levels of pain of stuff you want to buy just don't do that but I think this one was about eighteen hundred quid, and it it's I can tell the difference by looking at the 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 footage quality versus my six seven hundred pound camcorders. But don't let that stop you. You if if you're willing to learn about um, filmmaking or about shots and about lighting, the biggest the, the other big um, thing I learned, and it this was was from working with Russ, was lighting, lighting and and. Yeah, getting a shot right. Lighting will save you more hassle. It's like it's the, you know, uh, fix it in, fix it in the recording, fix it in the tracking, not in the mix. Fix it in your lighting, not in the edit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think rock stars. If you've ever just taken your cell phone and you did a photo or a video and you were outside on a nice day and you're like, my phone looks so great, and then you tried to take one later inside, and you're like, my phone looks like such crap. I mean, that's why. And so um, that I'm always struck light by that. source up there is really, really handy. Yeah, and it's hard to have a couple of those inside the studio, but um, the light that you need, you're right, is a lot brighter than you think, or, or just more daylight bulbs, you know, surrounding whatever you're doing, I think, right? I actually, in the studio, I've, I've built these kind of... Um, they, they, they were designed for... You know, if you have a, like a miniature shoot, you know, when, when you have like sort of models and stuff and someone's um doing either stop motion or they may be doing something really simple like a like a little pack shot or something um these reflector lamps that i bought were about 30 but 30 quid on ebay uh, or on amazon something like that and i've permanently hung them in the studio so when i do want to shoot i haven't got to worry about putting up umbrellas or or um, diffuser boxes or any of that stuff um, i turn my normal kind of studio lights as in the recording studio lights off turn these ones on because they're daylight balanced bulbs and everything just looks better. Um, it's not yeah. like I'm, I'm trying to fill a, an entire sound stage full of light. I'm basically going to sit in front of some piece of kit and talk about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, just get yourself some half decent lights. Some soft boxes will be great, but most of us don't have the space. I certainly don't. Yeah. And, and Rockstars, again, if you're wondering why we're talking about video production on a recording studio Rockstars thing, I'm going to... Um, come back to you. I'm going to volley that, that back to you and, and remind you that whether you're doing this for a hobby or whether you're doing music professionally, if you have a recording studio, you should learn some video production. Because if you're doing it as a hobby, you're probably a musician and you're hoping people will discover your music uh, if you want to share it with the world. And one of the best ways to do that is to be able to make videos of yourself playing the music, recording it, putting it out there as a music video. And if you're doing it professionally, you need to let people know, you know, what you do and what it looks like in your studio and, and all that, you know, your process. And so, again, you need to understand this stuff. Um, but the well, next I mean, I, level. I, I started, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I started location recordings as um, a mobile recording company. I thought, great. I really I, I, I'm definitely a tracking guy. I love going out you know fixing problems getting over hurdles and sorting stuff out live then recording the gig that to me is th that's my thing I, I love live tracking bands and stuff like that it's that's the thing I, I like doing um i think i'm good at problem solving and i'm good at going through going, why isn't that working okay we'll fix that and then you know th those sort of stuff that always happens on live gigs but these days the, the world's second biggest search engine is YouTube. Yeah. People don't just want to hear, as you say, don't just want to hear how good you are. They want to see how good you are, which is why yep. I got into video. Totally. Again, it wasn't intentional. Most of my career path wasn't through intention. It was through diversification. Oh, I'll learn a bit of that. Oh, I can make some money doing that. Okay. Um, 
I'll I'll, I'll hire some cameras. Hey, wait, for this wait are you job. sure you yeah. didn't say first? Oh, I can spend some money doing that. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I definitely decided that it was about earning money first. Um, Good. Anyone who who saw where I was sat right now would not think that. But I, I have a fun, fairly hard and fast rule about gear in the studio. But we'll come to that later, I'm sure. But um, yeah, it's it. People want to see what you do, and there is definitely something I'm a great believer in. If you look natural so it's playing an instrument i could probably tell you within three minutes of, of someone sitting down at a drum kit if they're ever going to be any good or not because they'll they'll look right that they won't look like they've got these kind of alien devices in their arms called drumsticks um <laughs> people want to see that people want to see if you if you're a, if, if you you give off the right vibe um what's the right vibe for one person might not be the other that's why we all have different client bases and there are plenty of clients out there and don't let anybody tell you they're not. So I'm going to add to that um, just a little more clarification. When you talk about YouTube being the second largest search engine, if somebody's scratching their head and going search engine, that just sounds so technical. Think about it as simple as this. Some, if, if, if somebody has heard of James Ivey for a minute and they're like, oh, I heard he was a pretty good drummer. I should find out more about him. You type James Ivey in, the, the first thing that comes up is maybe your website or maybe a social media link or something, or maybe right at the top there, a video of you playing drums. And that's the first thing they click on and they watch that for a second. Like you said, they're going to know right away, oh, this dude's awesome, you know, and then they, then there, there's the gig, you know, well, or there's I, the opportunity to play much. with music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. The, the funny thing is actually there is an American artist also called James Ivy, also spelled I V E Y. So he comes up there somewhere as well, but we haven't oh, been right. mixed up yet. <laughs> yeah, well, luckily he plays baritone uh, saxophone, so uh, <laughs> no confusion. Um, so then let me, let me jump to the next bit. So uh, again, takeaway rock stars, make sure you've got tons of lighting and make sure that your cameras are really simple uh, even using a GoPro and I was recording my own record in J January, I was like, Oh, I got to capture video. And quickly, even though I make videos all the time, I dumped that whole idea. Cause I was just like, there's just no way I can't be the artist and the producer and the engineer and perform well and be a videographer at the same time. So I'll just try, you know, to put up my GoPro and press record. And, uh, again, not to geek out too much, but even with that, you can have the wrong white balance setting in there and your video turns out looking like total crap. So but simple, GoPros, simple, simple. I've got six GoPros that I use for drum cam kind of recordings and they're awesome. You do need to know how to use them. But, you know, there are these things called manuals and PDFs and stuff. Um, and, you know, GoPros are designed for skateboarders and, and extreme sports guys. You know, us musos can work these things out we've we've practiced we've done our graft we can work yeah. cameras we're clever like that we're clever like that just make sure you work it the night before just like setting up for a session rather than the the moment you're supposed to start performing um all right so the next part of the question you've recorded the video um on these video devices or on gopros you're multi-tracking into pro tools if i was recording a normal session, there might be multiple takes that the comped version of the song might be a bunch of different um, sections uh, that are comped together to, to make up the full drum track. How do you, are there any clever tips for keeping the video clips organized with the audio so that we can um, keep those things in sync later and, you know, have a kind of a cool, compelling video that follows the music? Okay. Nine times out of 10, and this is going to, again, this is going to sound very um, idealistic, but hey, um, drums, guitars, bass are one take Be for that exact reason. It is very, very tricky to keep track of what takes you do. Um, maybe occasionally we'll lift a, a, a drum fill from a previous take, but it will probably be from one of two takes. It won't be go looking across... 80 something takes of a lead vocal to try and piece it together because that's just pain to a whole nother level no right. one no one needs that in their life um <laughs> certainly certainly not the amount of kind of um productions i'm working on on a weekly basis i haven't got time i'd, I'd rather go do you know what that take was rubbish scrap it um record another one then that way i know the last take on the video 
is the take. When, when I've got yeah. the one, I, that, that's how I know I've got the right take. Um, maybe for a lead vocal or someone else's lead vocal, I might be, a, be able to stretch that a little bit to maybe three or four takes. But when you put six cameras up on a drum kit, maybe two on a guitar, two on acoustic, two on a lead line, two on a vocalist, all of a sudden, and they're all 4K, so meaning they're higher than HD quality and hence the file size is quite large, you're up to 24 tracks of video. That's going to strain a lot of computers. Yeah. 24 <laughs> tracks of, of um, HD is, is heavy going. 24 channels of 4K is some serious heavy lifting. So don't. Get it right. Get it. Record the track that you want to film. It, yes. The, again, nine times out of ten, if you fluffed uh, one lyric, yes, you can. You can drop it in. Make a note that you filmed it as an extra, whatever. But get the bulk of the work done in one hit. And, nice. And, and That's be, good. And be good. You know, good, play well. Good advice because it brings us back to the fundamentals of just performing well in the studio too, which has always been at the core of making great records. Yeah, there's um, a right, reason so, the Wrecking Crew were, um, you know, made <laughs> thousands of records because they could all play better than the bands they were replacing. Right, right. They didn't do thousands of takes on one record. They did. They did thousands yeah. of records. Yeah, exactly, yeah. All right, so um, one more question about video, I promise, last one. Um, but I noticed that in your videos you have a nice little headset mic that, that makes it so that we can always hear what you're saying as you move about the studio and stuff. And... You know, maybe if you want to make a comment about using a headset mic on a video, that's fine. But maybe you could also just make a comment in general about, you know, the usefulness of headset mics, because I think if we're not doing live stage performance kind of recordings, we may not have a lot, a lot of experience with headset mics. What, how good are headset mics? What are they good for? What are they bad for? Would you ever use them on a recording session for something clever? Um, okay, so I'm going to give you an audio representation of why I use a headset mic. I'm quite animated when I'm um, speaking on a video and I tend to move my head and point, point myself to the gear a lot. Uh, and this is what happens when I do. So I'm talking, I'm talking, I turn around and if I'm wearing um, a lapel mic or a lavalier um, or a lavalier as you guys kind of strangely call it. Lavs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> My voice, the tone of my voice is going to change. The whole proximity effect thing is going to just, it's going to sound different. Not necessarily bad, but it will sound different. Whereas with a headset, when I turn my head, the microphone is always the same distance away from my mouth. Um, and it gives me the freedom. I actually um, use, it's a DPA headset, so it, it's, yeah. it's a very good one. Uh, and that's then plugged into a Sennheiser radio system, which then records into a Pro Tools system. Um, so I can actually get up and wander around the studio. I'm not tethered by a cable. Um, I do look kind of strange when I do answer the door with it sometimes. <laughs> they also look at me and go, well, why is that guy dressed up like Britney Spears? That's nothing to do with the headset. That's the other stuff. But Wait, is that because of the, yeah, no, is that because of the hot, tight pants? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a Friday thing. Um I, I jest, I really do. Uh, so I, I like the headset thing. Uh, it also means that when it comes to editing, there's less to worry about. Uh, there's, a, there's less dynamics to faff around with. I can, my sort of standard processing um, template works pretty well. Uh, if, I, if I'm videoing an interview, I will always use two lav mics because in an interview, it, I think it's a bit weird. On stage, as in for a, a stage performance or a, a, a production at a trade show, something like that, I, I think headsets are fine. But actually for video, where you it's just a couple of people talking, I think um, a lav mic, a tie clip is perfectly ser serviceable. And then you have to start worrying about phase from the other one. So you're going to, oh, there's yeah. always a trade-off. Uh, but no, that, that particular headset is very, very cool. And if you do find yourself doing a lot of this stuff as a solo shooter which i do i would definitely recommend going the radio route because it's one less cable to tie yourself up in indeed what was the one that you said you use you have a dpa headset and then it's um you DPA, said it was a techniques uh it's a uh, 
It's a Sennheiser, uh, EV, oh, Sennheiser. EW1D, the digital version, the Wi-Fi version. So I haven't got to worry about radio licenses or anything like that. Um, it hasn't got the range of a proper UHF system, but I'm probably at most three or four meters away, not 60, 70 feet away. So it works perfectly well. Very cool. All right, cool. Um, thanks for hipping us to that. And then I guess last part of the headset question is, can you imagine that being useful on an actual musical recording session? Are there some situations where you've ever thought, boy, a headset mic would have been the answer to the getting that just right? Uh, I've used it on flute, where I've actually not worried about have, having a mic stand or a microphone on the flute. I've used the headset on the flautist's head and positioned it in such a way. She was, again, she was quite animated. She moved around quite a lot. And it was yeah. solving a problem rather than um, for any, any it, it wasn't stylistic. It wasn't something we intended to do. It was like, we need to solve this problem. She's moving around a lot. She's sort of, you know, it, the, the amount of variation to and from the microphone was extreme. So I thought, let's mount the microphone on her. And, and that worked really well. Um, it's a great sound in mic. It's omnidirectional, I think. So, yeah, it, it worked really, really well. Great, well, so great solution. One of the first sessions I did when we were going around with a, a studio in a car is we went up to Boston into an old church and, and recorded um, an a African bushman named Yemakuma, who was, he, he, was a, he was actually an original dancer for Ola Tunji and would play hand drums and, and tell stories and get up and move around and stuff. And I was recording him, and I'd put up a vocal mic and then a pop screen in front of him. But in order for him to perform the recording, he had to make eye contact with us. And we'd have to sit in the front rows, the front pews. And he would continue, like the mic was in the way. So he kept moving off to the side to look around the mic to talk to us and tell us the stories. And that was one of the first times I thought about it. I was like, you know, if the mic just stayed on his voice the whole time, that would probably be a good solution here. So I, I think that's cool to hear you talk about using it in that context with the flute. Yeah, it, 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 say it wasn't something I would have gone out to and thought, I oh, know, I'll use a, a headset mic, but I'll put it on the flute. It, it solved a problem. And the problem was we couldn't get a decent quality recording. Um, I've got, uh, it, it sounds ridiculous for a, a very, very small studio, but I've got over 100 microphones and we couldn't make a fairly large collection of them work for this particular floor. So the DPA worked. And so we Oh, man. It. It's nice to hear you say you've got over 100. That makes me feel better because I'm, <laughs> I'm not quite there, but I thought I had way too many, and so now I feel much you better. You can never have too many microphones, but hey. That's awesome. <laughs> so, Rockstars, we're going to take a break for just a second. Uh, we'll come back in in just a moment for the jam session. A reminder that you'll find links to what we're talking about in the show notes, and um, including a YouTube playlist of Jivey's not jive at all videos on YouTube, which are super cool. And uh, we'll see you in just a moment for the jam session. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your existing Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM install an SSD drive, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock, OWC will help take your studio far into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. 
If you want to capture every nuance of a great performance in your studio, then you need to start with a microphone that is crafted with great care and attention to detail. Jay-Z Mics in Riga, Latvia designs amazing sounding microphones that are handcrafted with jeweler's precision to bring you incredible detail in your recordings. At the heart of Jay-Z Microphones is the unique Golden Drop capsule design, which uses a lighter, faster diaphragm that delivers great clarity and fidelity while avoiding distracting colorations and distortions. Make sure to check out the Vintage Series V67 and V11 with Class A discrete amplifier circuitry, extremely low self-noise, and advanced built-in shock mount technology to bring a classic, expensive vintage sound to your studio for an affordable price. Jay-Z offers a five-year warranty, free shipping to the U.S., and a 30-day money-back guarantee. Plus, for a limited time, you can use the coupon code ROCKSTAR to get 50% off their Vintage Series microphone. I got one. You're hearing my voice right now on the V67. Wouldn't it feel great to have one of these in your studio? Go to jzmike.com or click the link in the show notes below. Hey, rock stars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is James Ivey joining us from the UK uh, to talk about making great records. We're going to dig into his studio right now and talk about recording. So, James, are you ready to jam? Uh, let's go for it. All right, dude. Um, Tell us more about your studio. I want to know all about location recording um, and, you know, this. I, I think it's the studio that I'm seeing in your videos when you were recording Damned If I Do and Rosanna, right? Yes, the building is the same. The The contents of the building has definitely grown and changed over the... God, I think Rosanna must be getting on for not eight, nine years ago now. Um, I had the absolute pleasure of joining uh, a recording studio legend. In fact, two two legends, um, both of whom I now call my friends, um, Al Schmidt and Steve Jenowick, down in um, south of France for the Mix with the Masters. Um, and I'm not going to say it's, it's Al's fault that I bought a console, but I definitely embraced the console way of working. So I now have an Audion ASP8024 console, uh, I'm an HDX user. About two years ago, I, I made the evil switch. I chose the dark side. Yes, I use a PC. Oh, um, no way. Yeah, I, I, I took the dark path because it wasn't an audio decision. It was a video decision uh, because, yeah. as, as we were saying earlier, um, productions are getting bigger. They are, getting, they are needing more horsepower. And my, bless it, my Mac Pro 2010 was pimped to the max and it was still having, it was still struggling. So I decided to bite the bullet and go over the PC route. All right, dude, I love it. That's that's been awesome. The title of this episode right now, James Ivey, Pimp to the Max. (laughs) 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 Um, So that's Um, cool, man. I'm glad you brought that up because I think that that is a question for a lot of people is like, can I make a transition from a Mac to a PC and Pro Tools? So uh, if you feel comfortable about it, you know, riff on, yeah. tell us what you ran into. What are the, what are the struggles? What are the big wins of doing that? Okay. So the biggest win is no matter what your DAW, other than logic, because obviously it's only, um, Mac based. Um, once you're in, if you have a stable machine and a stable platform, uh, once you're in your DAW, it does not matter. Pro Tools is Pro Tools. Okay. I had to kind of re-memorize a few, um, modifier shortcut key, alterations Mm -hmm. but it it doesn't matter give yourself a little while to adjust it's fine Um, i still hate windows as a uh, it's foibles for file manipulation and how it roots stuff it doesn't ever seem to follow any kind of rules Um, you'll think you've been back to the same folder six times for an edit and then all of a sudden it'll take you somewhere that you haven't been for six months it's like Yeah, but the actual machine is so much more configurable. I've got so much more power under the hood than I had before. My my, my Pro Tools actually, um, my Pro Tools demands on a machine are pretty straightforward. I'm not big into virtual instruments. I'm not a heavy plugin user. Um, for me, I have the console, so that's most of my EQ. I've got quite a bit of outboard kit. That's my dynamics, and it's get it capture it right in the first place is definitely again i heard another great phrase um track like there's no mixing mix like there's no mastering i love that yeah um i think that was jonas westling who i heard say it um he may not have coined it but definitely 
um, a mantra by which to um, lead your studio lives. Um, yeah, track like there's no mixing, mix like there's no mastering. And that's definitely a process I go, I try and go for. Um, I'm very lucky. I get to try an awful lot of the latest and greatest and companies leave stuff with me for a very long time. That's why the studio looks incredibly chocker and um, I'm not in beaten up shoes and worn out Levi's. <laughs> and also um, luck's got nothing to do with it. I'm pretty sure you put in a lot of hard work to create those opportunities as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I think uh, I'm not going to say I'm not, I'm a great believer in networking. I'm a great believer in putting yourself in harm's way. Um, when, when I was let go by Avid after six years with Sibelius, um, one of the things I was very certain of is was this wasn't going to take me down. It wasn't going to beat me. Um, being made redundant these days is not such a, doesn't have the stigma attached to it. It did in our parents or our grandparents' days. It was like, oh, you were made redundant. Oh no, life, life as you knew it was over. Hey, this is the music industry. If you want a job for life, uh, be an accountant. Don't, be a, <laughs> don't really. do what we do. Um, I know lots of people who have started on the road to self-employment and self-fulfillment and they've gone, do you know what? This is not for me. It's not for everyone. Uh, if you like knowing where your salary is coming from every month, for God's sake, don't do this. It's but a, if it's a could, good point. My, my C, CPA has been with me for 20 years. It's one of the only jobs, 25 years, it's one of the only jobs I can think of where I've just worked with the same individual over and over and over again. Yeah. I've I've got clients I've had for many 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 years, but they they come and go and I've got, so I've got a couple of guys who I work we have a deal where we do a number of tracks throughout the year and and, and I really enjoy that because I know there's a certain amount of um, uh, sustainability in what I do almost but yeah you know if if you're worried about if you haven't got a, a bit of a, a backup plan uh, you know a couple of quid stashed away. Don't start a recording studio. I know lots of people who had no spare cash, um, an awful lot of debt, and went to the wall very quickly when, you know, uh, build it and they will come. Well, actually, not necessarily. There are plenty of clients out there, but you have to network. You have to put yourself in harm's way. I just, I'm um, sorry. I, I thought of a really funny expression when you said that it, in the recording studio world, it's build it and they will go next door. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we've all heard of, I mean, London is, is a classic city for um, a place that was full of great recording studios. I mean, amazing rooms, incredible facilities with amazing gear and amazing people. There are probably five now. Yeah. Five of the bigger, bigger rooms left. Uh, in inside in, in what we would call London, you know, there's Air, there's Abbey Road. Um, Is Olympic still there? No, gone, gone. Trident, Olympic, gone. I'm running they're, out of name dropping. Yeah, ex exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, and I'm going to struggle to think of them off the top of my head. Um, Metropolis is still there. Um, Townhouse has gone. So many great spaces have, have gone. Um, Sony Whitfield Street was an amazing space, gone. So if you're faint-hearted, don't do this. You don't have to be a stuntman, but you do have to be a little bit um, resilient to yeah. thinking, where's the next paycheck coming from? But if you can be that sort of person, it's incredibly rewarding. You get to be creative. I get to, I get to play drums every day. I get to play guitar every day. I get to be a creative person. Um... People say, what do you do for a living? I said, oh, I, I go down the shed. <laughs> because I, I never know what... I, I, I plan, I, I make a certain amount of um, preparation day to day, but I never know how one day is going to go day, day to day, you know, how the next yeah. one's going to be, what I'm going to do. It's great. I love it. Me too. It's fun, man. I was, I, another, I'm, I'm all full of dumb analogies, but I feel like you know, if, you're the, if you're the hair, then uh, be a musician in a band playing on stage. And if you're the tortoise, then you might be ready for opening a studio. Not, not because yeah, that should be the well, way you yeah. work every day, but you need to be like slow and patient and persistent, I think, sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 for a long time, I was um, burning the, the metaphorical, ca metaphorical candle both sides of the glass. 
There's twisting your metaphors. Um, I was in a band. We were doing 150 odd, 200 gigs a year. And I was doing the studio thing. And, and eventually it does catch up with you. You know, sleep is a, a beautiful, wonderful thing. Um, I appreciate we all work late. We all do silly long hours and all that sort of stuff. But um, you, you, when your health starts to fail or you go, hang on, there's something definitely wrong here. Why am I waking up feeling like a 70 year old man when I'm mid thirties and it hurts, you know, that's, there's, that's something def- definitely wrong there. Hey man, um, in, in the words of Warren Zevon, I'll sleep when I'm dead. <laughs> yeah. I'll sleep when I'm dead, but can I have a nap occasionally? Just, yeah. But I might <laughs> just be dead next week. So, um, you know, either way, anyway, you slice it. Well, Hey, so I know we digress a little bit. Tell us more about some of the wins of going on to PC. I mean, like I know that, um, I've heard, I've heard about PCs and I've heard that you can get a very powerful rig for, you know, less of an, an investment. Um, you can, but it won't be branded and it won't be certified. My PC was not dissimilar money to a, a Mac Pro trash can. Okay. I have significantly more power than a machine that is now four years old i think um but you know if you bought still if you buy a, a mac pro today you're going to buy a trash can where the specs are four years old that's a statement of fact yeah and you're going to spend three three and a half thousand quid doing it um three and a half thousand pounds buys you the mother of all pcs yes it won't look as pretty it won't have a fruit logo on it <laughs> and and you will be annoyed by the fact that you know you're going to have to relearn a few shortcuts and stuff, but actually the wins are the power. Yeah. And the fact that if you decide six months down the line that you that your forty pound graphics card was a bit rubbish, it it did the job. But you actually want to run two four K screens now. You haven't got to buy a new machine. You buy a new graphics card. Mm. Um, if if you find that your sixteen gig of RAM isn't enough, you can put three terabytes in. You've got to pay for it. But you can do it. Good Lord. Three I, terabytes of RAM. That's insane. I can put three terabytes of RAM in this machine. Um, and spread where, across so where many does, and, Yeah. So where does something like that become really um, useful? Is it video? In video. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, pro, pro, you know, 16, 30, I, I think I'm running 64 gig of RAM at the moment. Um, and I, and I've, I've never maxed Pro Tools to the point where... Pro Tools falls over in track count and things like that on this machine before I run out of power. I mean, we've done power test sessions on machines, you know, where you've got four or 500 plugins um, running across 256 channels with Boom, with Channel Strip, with 11 plugin, yeah. um, which are all kind of standardized stuff you get with Pro Tools for those non Pro Tools users out there. Um, I think we called it the Mac Pro Power Test, but I ran it on this machine and you know, it, it got ridiculous. Um, I, bet, I bet it sounded really good. <laughs> it sounded absolutely horrendous. <laughs> across 200 tracks, you know, it was absolutely mental. Awesome. But ju- just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. I- I'm actually, say, quite a light plugin user. I probably have about 10, 15 plugins that I use most of the time. I think if we're all honest, we probably all do. We have our go-tos. Um so yeah, there have been a few things, um, drive formats being a bit of an issue, but there are tools to get around that. I can't think of the ones off the top of my head. And of course, I'm currently in record mode in Pro Tools, so I don't really want to go diving around. Mm. Um, there's Synergy, which is a great way to be able to share keyboards across more than, share one keyboard across more than one machine, which is really cool because I, I still still do have a MacBook Pro running as well because... You know, I, I do have to speak both both languages, PC and Mac still. Mm-hmm. Um, it's great. People said, oh, Thunderbolt will never work properly on PC. Ah, wrong. Thanks for playing. It works really, really well. HDX works great in it. Um, USB is fine. I've got drive bays. I've got PCI slots. All those things we had with our um, Mac Pro cheese graters that we don't have anymore. So unless Apple are going to reinvent the the um the cheese grater and i hate to say it boys and girls they're not mm. um pc is going to be the way forward i've heard a lot of top end studio people 
um, friends in very big facilities around the world who are all thinking about going the PC route, not because they they they're embracing the fruit factory and they hate Bill Gates or whatever. Um, it's because they have a job to do and this is going to be the tool to do it. Right, right. Well, that's interesting. So, because that was going to be my question is, you know, you made a decision to switch and go over to the dark side, as you called it, uh, because of the power that it would give you for the video that goes along with the audio that you do, you know, but my question would have been, but do you recommend it um, or is it recommended for people for just who are just interested in the audio? And it sounds like that's the answer that there are those who are considering it because, you know, as if the technology becomes obsolete then you've got to figure out a way to keep moving forward. But we we don't have to um, beat that horse any longer either. <laughs> um, it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's, it is a real relevance because whatever this machine, say we've talked about this a lot on, on our podcast and on the site, but whatever that machine the the fruit company are going to come out with, it is not going to be cheap. Right. A good PC is also not cheap. Yes, you can go to Best Buy or PC World or wherever you like and buy a $250, £250 machine, but don't. I don't and don't expect it to run pro audio. Just don't. Yeah. Spend some decent you get you genuinely get as with all things, you get what you pay for. All right, well let me ask you this. If somebody's thinking about it, where do you go to find your answers um, as far as what PC you should consider getting if you're ready to make that switch? If you're a Pro Tools user, look on the Avid approved list. Um, there are smart people out there who can build machines. I'm not one of them. I uh, have friends in low places, as we all do, uh, and I sought advice. And he said, "I can get one of these and configure it for you." Check, uh, you know, uh, in the UK we have Pro Audio specialists. We have um, high end, high tech music stores. Um, I can think of a couple in the US, certainly someone like uh, RSP will be able to help you out, Vintage King, I'm sure. Um, speak to those guys. They, you know, they're all in the, in the habit these days of specking systems, not just selling cardboard boxes. So if you are looking to um, move to the dark side, and I, I jest, I, I call it that because it's funny and I'm a Star Wars <laughs> super fan. Um, it, you know, it, 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 you, you, you won't, you won't catch plague or anything like that from using a Windows machine. You, you, you will still be able to record. Things will still work. Pro Tools still functions. Um, I remember back on um, Windows NT, it wasn't so happy back then. But we have come a long way since then. To be honest. Give yourself a week and you won't even realize you're using Windows. Well, in the uh, words of the famous Bruce Swadeen, um, nobody ever left the record store singing this or humming the sound of the console. And I yes. think that nobody ever left the record store um, humming the sound of the computer it was recorded on either. Exactly. Who cares? Just, just what, what, There are plenty of other things to worry about in the recording process than what platform you recorded it on. Ooh, I'm so glad you said that. Let's go worry about them right now. So... Now, one of the things that I know is important to you is a mix and match of like this hybrid of out of the box analog gear and using um, computer to record with. Talk about more about location um, audio uh, recording, excuse me, location recording, your studio and how you've configured it to sort of interface all these things and maybe just your philosophy around that. Okay. Um I originally built this space to be my mix space for anything that I recorded on location. And I very soon realized that people actually liked the um, the idea of coming to a studio. I thought, I'll go to you, that place where you're comfortable, and I'll take enough stuff and we'll make a recording. Actually, people like the event of coming to a recording studio. They, they, they like being out of their comfort zone. I, yeah. I get that. Um. So I wanted the studio to be somewhere where, within reason, you could make any noise that you wanted to make. There's, so there's a good selection of good guitars. I've got a good Strat, a good Les Paul, a good Telecaster. You know, my guitar guitar lust list is long. Um, and the old joke that uh, when I die, I hope my wife doesn't sell my guitar collection for what I told her they cost me is definitely <laughs> true in this room. Um, 
and say for a drummer, I think I have 15 guitars and string, stringy type instruments, which is kind yeah. of bizarre. Well, for a guitar um, player, I have at least six or seven snares, so yeah, touche. Yeah. Um, so that was the idea. That was the, the, the ethos behind this place, to be able to come in and make a great record. Um, there are lots of other facilities around the world that have that ethos, and they have significantly more kit and space than I have. But that was the idea for, for my, my space, my studio. And it's kind of grown into this hybrid workflow that I'm embracing. So I, so I record with an analog console. I love it. For me, it's a, a way to work really, really fast. Uh, it's also a very flexible way because I'm testing and reviewing a lot of equipment. The patch bay and a few tweaks that I've made recently um, have made working with gear that's not hanging around very long a very, very easy, simple process to deal with. Um, I'm, say I'm, I'm always changing things. I'm always looking for the next thing. I have this kind of um, a philosophy, if I may, again, go off on one of those tangents. Um, back when I was, you know, knee high to the grasshopper and learning on a four track. Grasshopper. Imagine that, imagine that as the first centimeter on your meter rule, on your hundred centimeter rule. Now imagine, you know, name your legendary studio, Capital, um, East West, oh, um, yeah, East West Capital, uh, Universal Next Door, uh, your Abbey Road, uh, Air Lindhurst, name your, name your studio. Now they're at the 100 centimetre mark, they're your goal. I think that most of us with a DAW, a, a reasonable section of mics, a nice-ish preamp, could probably be up in the 90 centimetre distance, quality-wise. Mm -hmm. Getting that last 10 centimetres is expensive. It is millions and millions of pounds expensive. It's the space, it's the infrastructure, it's the support staff, it's the receptionist, it's, you know, all those other things that, that us um, home studioists, if you like, can't afford. Mm. But all these little things, all the little things can chip away at that. Um, good monitor mounts, good cable management, good, you know, installation, keeping everything tidy, make sure everything works. All those things chip away at that extra little bit. All the little things. I'm a great believer in little gimmicks and little tweaks and, you know, one little thing that will make that sound better. The next little thing that will make that job easier. Um, all those things are the things that chip away at that last 10 centimetres. Yeah. I'd like to think I'm up sort of 95, 96 centimetres towards my goal of that 100. Um, You're the Lilliputian of, of, of music producers. Yeah, I, I'd like to think I'm... I'm, I'm <laughs> I'm chipping away at it. I'll never get there because, you know, once when you do get there, you go you go to the next big studio and go, wow, I want this space. You know, I walked into Capital and just gone, ah, what I do for a space like this? And it's not just the space or the gear. It's the whole package. It's the fact that, you know, you, you walk in and someone says, good morning, Mr. Sinatra, yeah. you know. Um, it, it's, it's the stuff of legends. And... I think we should all be aspiring to it. We should all do everything we can to get to that space. If, if, even if that's learning a plugin, learning a process, le learning more about the gear you do have rather than lusting over more stuff that you don't really know how to use. Well, let's let's dig into some of that right now. I know, you know, your your number one instrument is drums and you're a fantastic drummer and you get great drum sounds. Um and yet, when I see the video, I realize you're in a very small space for the drums. It's tiny. It's yes. absolutely tiny. So talk to us about how you get great drum sounds in such a small space. I mean, sometimes I think we're, we ha we're compelled to have like this big, giant studio. And we're probably screwing up our drum sounds in a big room. Um, I, I like lots of drums and lots of cymbals, which generally translates into liking lots of mics. Uh, in my room, I cannot do things like the Glyn Johns technique. I, I don't have height. I don't have width. My current kit just about fits in the drum room. And to give you some idea, at its widest point, the drum room is two metres wide by a smidge over three metres long, which right. is tiny. And, yeah. I mean, and height-wise, if you're anything more than 6'5", you're going to struggle. 
If you let's put it this way, Rockstars, if you take the stick and you reach forward, you're poking the walls in every direction. Yeah, and, and I, I have hit the mics that are on the mounted on the ceiling during recording time. <laughs> okay, that's, that's so, how tiny it is. So now another thing that I notice about your drums, though, is there's there's a real clarity to them. It's like if they're punchy and they're clear, and you can hear each drum. And sometimes we struggle to get that when we're recording in bigger spaces. So I've talked to us a little bit about how you get, you know, maybe what you would call sort of high fidelity in that small space. Um, it's quite simple, really. I, it's like, again, it's it's good mics, good cable, um, placed on good sounding drums. The drums sound good in the first place. Um, it was quite bizarre. A happy accident happened recently, and I left a random microphone on and in the recording path. Um, and I ended up with a room mic, that, and actually the room mic on its own sounded incredible. It was an incredible sounding drum mic, but that was actually in the control room where I left the door open for some oh, bizarre nice. reason. Um, well, so it was, a prob- it was probably sort of four or five metres away rather than four or five inches away from the kit normally. Um, it's My drum sound has been a labour of love to get, the, to get the sound that I'm now putting out. Um, uh, the the kit that was used on things like Rosanna and on the Damned If I Do was a um, I can't remember if Damned If I Do was the green kit I think it probably was the the Yamaha um, that's a that's a great sounding drum kit you know my my current kit in the studio is um, a new Sonor SQ2 which is a beautiful sounding kit probably the best kit I've ever owned and will ever own um, yeah, so Sonar's it starts are great from kits. the drums it starts from the sound of the drums. Um, again, I've got a, a reasonable selection of snare drums that I've probably got three or four that I go to more often than not. Um, good sounding cymbals. Cheap cymbals sound cheap. End of. Um, mm. If you want good sounding cymbals, you have to pay for it. Um, you can. You don't have to go for the two obvious brands or three obvious brands. There are other brands out there which are less expensive, but it still costs money. You know, A ride cymbal is a chunk of... Um, I can't even remember the actual... Uh, I feel like allergical. I think of singles as I mean, excuse me. I think of symbols as being about a couple of hundred bucks each. Yeah, definitely. Uh, a good ride symbol, a bit more than that. A good pair of hi hats, significantly more than that. But you know, there's a there's a reason these things cost. Um, and, and cheap symbols sound cheap. Full stop. Sorry, well, let, I can't beat that. Let's talk about where you put your mics in your in your space. So, assuming um, somebody else has a small space. Um, and they got a drum set in there, and maybe they got like three toms and a, and a handful of cymbals and a hi-hat and a ride. What are some smart things to do to the walls to make sure the drums don't sound, you know, that the room's not messing up the drum sound? And then where, where, where are some smart places to start putting mics on the kit? Okay, so I, I've played drums in studios that are so dry, it's really uncomfortable drums like a reverberant space to speak so um anyone who's seen any of my videos and stuff will probably know that i have a um fairly sizable sliding triple gaze kind of patio door type type thing as my divider between the drum room and the control room um on the opposing wall to that is a fairly thick curtain on the wall behind me is a diffuser on the two walls in front of me on the wall in front of me rather are two fairly large absorbers. It's about mixing your treatment for me. Right. Um, so you don't necessarily get standing waves, but you don't completely kill the vibe of the room. The I, I built this space from from the ground up, as in I dug a hole, I filled it with concrete, and I then put a, a, a prefabricated, if you like, a wooden shell on, and then I built the, the inside walls and all that sort of stuff. Um all done with my fair hands, which weren't very fair after <laughs> six months of hard labour. Um, but so it, it's a, it's not about killing the room off. You don't want it so live that you go right. Well, you're not going to get that in a small you, space anyway. Unless, exactly, unless it's painted like an echo chamber. Yeah, it's, it's shellac walls and all that sort of stuff. You're never going. It's never going to happen. Um, with regards to mics, find mics you've that are a couple of quid. Don't go for the cheap, the cheapest of the cheap because they sound it. Um, also, if you hit those, that's it. Good night, Vienna. Uh, they're, they're they're destroyed. Um, 
it's taken a long time to work out the sound, the, the drum mics that I really like. Um, I have a f- no particular... Um, I'm not going to say, oh, they're all a particular brand because they're not. They're a complete mix and match of stuff. My yeah. overheads have taken me absolutely years to find mics that I really like for drum overheads. Um, I'm currently using a pair of Vanguard Audio. Um, I can't remember what the name The pencil condensers, the new ones. They, they sound amazing. But, but pencils, um, you, you tried large diaphragms and you you favored uh, small diaphragms? Um, I, I think it depends on the track. Uh, right. the, the overheads are the one things I will change. I've got a pair of um, the Warm Audio WA87s, the, their, their version of the U87. Mm-hmm. And I really like those for overheads, but they don't work for everything. They kind of, if, if I said kind of smoky music, kind of sort of jazz and um, big band, maybe sort of dark, darker sounding stuff. Whereas if you're doing a pop record, you want your cymbals to be nice and shiny and zingy and clean. Right. Um, for me, it's small diaphragms pencils and then what about um so are you doing like top and bottom miking on the snare do you Definitely. do you ever explore top and bottom on the toms too uh i've never done top and bottom toms because i've I've never heard what a tom tom sounds like from underneath the right. reason i would mic a snare bottom is because i want to hear more of the sizzle from the snare the actual the yeah. shh, shh, shh sound if you like yeah um the bottom snare mic doesn't sound very nice but it does give you some of that that snare wire rattle um i tune my toms so they sound nice where i'm sat (laughs) yeah (laughs) that's that's, again very selfish if you like i'm not i'm not tuning them to project out it so turns out on a good kit they probably will sound great out the front as well but I, i like the sound where i'm sat i think if if i could have a pair of those kind of binaural headphony things and i i could guarantee getting the sound i like from that i'd probably just use a pair of those and a kick drum mic. Right, because you're, you're, you're playing the drums to sound good to your head, and if you yeah. could just capture that, you're done. That would be great. Theoretically. <laughs> yeah, I, I, like the, I, I love the idea of that, but in practice it, it would never happen because we all want to hype up the bass drum. We all want to give the snare more, more crack. We want to compress it to get that kind of gush sound. We want a different reverb tail on the snare than we do on the overheads, yada, yada, yada. We want the control. Um Funnily enough, when people say, you get a great drum sound, I say, yeah, it's called Ocean Way. <laughs> okay, so that's my next question is, if you're recording drums in this small room, you don't, you know, unless you accidentally leave a mic up in the control room, you typically don't have room mics and you're going to no. be relying on things that you can do once it's inside, you know, well, either once it's inside Pro Tools or if you have some outboard stuff through a console. But talk a little bit about some some. Sp- things that people are likely to enjoy trying out on, on creating space around drums? Um, if you are a UAD, a Universal Audio UAD user, try Ocean Way. It will just blow your mind. Um, don't try it on the, the reverb settings. Try it on the room emulation settings. Um, and then I actually have a, a stereo pair of faders on my console, which I route through an Apollo 16 so I have, <laughs> I've on my console, I've got things like, I, I do have a hardware Bricasti, and it's awesome. I do have a couple of other reverb units, like grot box type things. But I have um, an EMT-140 plate, a 250, uh, a Lexicon 480L on my auxiliaries on the console. Not because I have that hardware, but I'm using them in the UA um, environment, yeah. running real time off a, off a UA interface that I'm not using for actual recording. Oh, which interesting. Is, which is very, very cool. And it's kind of like, well, that's that's a different spin on it. Those those um, emulations sound incredible. So I'm just putting the, bringing them up on a console on my auxiliaries, and it sounds absolutely killer. And then you so could, you could I, actually record that into the other interface into Pro Tools if you wanted to. Yeah, if I want to, yeah. I, I can. Um, my current system runs across 12 microphones. And I have a 24-channel console. So for, for recording drums, sorry. So if I want, and I, I don't necessarily know what the client wants, I can record 12 channels of drums clean and 12 channels of drums processed through my outboard chains. Mm-hmm. And I can do that. in That's one take. That's just that's simultaneous record with processing, without processing. Um, and if I want to, then I can bounce that down to a stereo pair and record that as well. 
and apply effects processing and all that sort of stuff. Um, well, one thing that brings to mind for me too, when you talk about using this interface and then bringing it up on the console um, and remembering the discussion about switching from a Mac to a PC, is just reminding all of us that um, if you're clever about it, sometimes you can keep around an old recording rig, move it off to the side and turn it into just like, you know, maybe eight, eight ins and outs of, of an effects processor. You could cr absolutely just yeah. load up some reverbs on it and leave it there and then just bring those outputs back and, you know, incorporate them on your console or bring them into the other computer and free up some processing. Yeah, totally. And, th and that's pretty much what I'm doing. Okay, the UA stuff is, it is processing in hardware because they use their, their DSP chips. But, you know, I've got some of the most sought after outboard gear in dsp why would we not use it yes i do like my hardware as well um but i'm not sure i could afford to revalve a fairchild every six months right <laughs> i certainly couldn't afford to buy the thing let alone maintain it also in that um, little room you'd get pretty hot pretty quickly it, yeah i mean heat heat is definitely an issue in here i do have air conditioning fortunately even in london i have air conditioning but yeah heat is definitely um a battle in here that's for sure This show is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy. Are you ready to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level and make your best record ever? Then visit the Academy to find the course that's right for you. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you are ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own record, Skadoosh, using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. These techniques would work for you in whichever DAW you are using right now. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins in Pro Tools. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads to mix in your own studio and even include in your mixing portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle bundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode well um so let me ask you also about uh the guitar side of things um i've seen some videos with you i think it was the was it the um the audio uh, audience sono was a guitar yeah. audio interface yeah, that was um, a recent one. And I, I just, I got the impression you have a lot of experience with recording guitars and using sort of like clever simulators, amp simulators and stuff. And I wondered if you wanted to talk about that and just talk about, you know, real amps versus simulators and what kind of stuff's possible out there for us. You know, maybe we need to break down some myths if people are, you know, trying to be too precious about one choice versus another. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one because... I I was one of the first demonstrators in in the UK, if if not the, the main sort of European demonstrator for the Avid Eleven Rack, um, and I love the thing. I still do. It's it's Avid's lo longest lasting product, I think, ever. Um, it's an amazing piece of kit. It still sounds really great. And for a rhythm part, or for a kind of a um, something that's going to be spread out wide in the mix. I will still use the 11 rack. But for that lead solo, that big moment where you want the guitar to really bite and cut through, I will go for a real amp every mm -hmm. single time. Because that you can you can layer up kind of if we if we call it fake versus real, the fake guitar parts and they sound great and you can but as soon as you want one to really reach out and grab you and buy a, you know, buy a sensitive area if you like. A, a real cab with some mics on it is going to sound way more real, way more authentic. Um, I don't know why, because the emulations are great. Um, I've never used a Kemper, although I hear great things. I've never used an Axe FX, and again, I, I hear great things. I'm not a great fan of software amp emulations. I like um, the two-note stuff that's going on inside things like the Sono and the... Um, 
two notes torpedo things like that i had a, i've got a torpedo um i think it's with the buddy at the minute um yeah. And that, that's a really great kind of halfway house, if you like. So if you haven't got the space to do big room sound guitars, which, let's face it, who has, that's a really good option. But I still like the sound of a close mic'd guitar cab with a couple of mics on it, a ribbon and a 57. Uh, and that just, for me, is that big rock and roll guitar sound. Yeah, it's, it makes me think of vocals, you know your background vocals can stand a whole lot more tuning and treatment and manipulation and effects, but your lead just by the nature of it being front center and right up in your face, especially with a vocal, um, where our human ear is, we're, we're so attuned to what sounds natural and real that, um, that we pick up very quickly on something if it doesn't sound that way. And I think that what you're describing with the guitars, you know, when you have a front center guitar, it's it's it needs to feel more like a vocal. It's more expressive. It has to be real, and and so those maybe are some of the things that you pick up on. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm I'm fairly sure that some great sounding records have been made with amps and plugins and things like that. But I find it takes a long time to dial in a tone that you really really are digging in an amp sim. Whereas I can turn on one of the sort of three or four amps I've got here and know within, I, I know which amp's going to sound right. I know which one I'm going to enjoy playing. I know which parameters I need to tweak to get the sound I'm going to feel. Yeah. I'm not one. I do print a DI, a clean DI, but I can count on one hand the number of times I've actually gone back to it and gone, eh, do you know what? That tone's not working because it felt right at the time. Let's talk about how you do that. So um, can you explain to the rock stars how they would print a clean DI if they're going to plug a guitar into an amp? Um, I, know, I know it sounds like a dumb question, yeah, but it would be a, helpful a, a for DI some box, people. Basically, you, you need some way of splitting the signal. Now, generally, that's a DI box or a reamp box is the, is the sort of direct opposite. Um, a passive DI box generally will just split the signal two ways. Um, you can have an output that goes straight to your, um, your guitar amp which effectively, um, the phrase you're looking for is true bypass usually on these sort of things. It, it basically, it needs to not taint the sound because right. it, it wants to be as if you'd plug straight into the amp. Anything that is going to to adjust the sound or change the impedance or change the load onto the amp, that's a bad thing because, you know, you don't want it to change things uncontrollably. You then just send a clean signal off to your your audio interface and record a clean signal. That way you can, if you want, process that with some internal plugins or whatever, um, run it at, back out through an amp, through a reamp box. Um, there are loads of different options. So I like the 11 rack because it gives me lots of different options for uh, routing stuff straight through and it doesn't mess with the signal. It will just give me a straight out. I can plug straight into the 11 rack and then plug into an amp through um, through various sort of configurations inside inside the thing, and you wouldn't. It's like the, like the cable is going straight into the amp, and that's what yeah. it's really cool for. Now, um, when I've had like Roger Allen Nichols on the show, he he one of his tips was if you're going to record with the simulator, um, he advised going through s tubes first with the guitar. So like the guitar into some sort of tube pre and then into the simulator although i think he was talking about going in you know through a line input on pro tools into a a plug-in simulator have you found that even with something like the um the 11 rack that it can be helpful to go through some sort of uh high high quality or hi-fi pre first or really you just plug the guitar straight in like you described and that's that's really all you need to think about not with the 11 rack because the the input is um true z and it's the only time you'll ever hear a brit saying z rather than z okay. um because of the, because of the impedance matching and the load matching it does um if i'm recording and i want to and i'm say testing a an amp sim plug-in yes i will go through even if the even if the pedal is in bypass i will go through a pedal first it just seems to buffer the input into the daw if i'm going straight into a line input in in my interface or on the console, I will always go through a pedal first. It just it seems to do something that makes it better. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not enough of an electronics guru to really 
dig in on that particular subject, but it just does something. Well, I, I, um, without being an electronics guru, I think we can share this, just the simple fact that inputs and outputs of gear has something called impedance, and the impedance coming out of a guitar pickup is way different from the impedance of all the rest of the gear we use. And, yeah, And totally. that, that's why it can sound so funny when you just try and plug it straight into something. Um, I've... It's funny because I've been looking for an amp, a new guitar amp recently that played nicely with pedals. I've got a Chandler GAV 19T, which is an amazing, real uh, multifaceted amp, but it doesn't play nicely with pedals on the front end. I mean, it's like a 2,000 quid amp, and it doesn't play nicely with pedals on the front end. Um, a friend of mine said, check out this PV thing, you know, like this classic 20-watt tube thing. You put... Um, you know, a reasonable Maxon pedal or a, a radial pedal or something sort of a bit more fruity in front of that. It sounds incredible. Um, it's like a 300 pound amplifier and it just sounds great if you put a pedal in front of it. Um, mm. So sometimes there's no, there's no rhyme or reason to it. Get a sound that you like, that you're happy with and record it. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> I think whenever we're wondering about that, just go back and study some of the great blues musicians who used the wrong guitar into the wrong amp and you know, created a, a, a genre-defining sound out of it. Yeah. You just I mean, you find um, that stuff all Rory the time. Rory Gallagher used to have two, vo two um, Fender Twins pointing at each other with a microphone in the middle. <laughs> that, <laughs> nice. It should have sounded horrendous, but it's, it's his sound. It's the sound. It's an iconic guitar tone. That's great. That's great. Well, um, we've been going for a good long stretch, James, so maybe I will jump to our closing jam session questions and we can just kind of um, go through them quickly if you want. You, you still got some yeah, time for that? Me. All right, Groovy. So yeah, okay. um, first question, when you started out in recording, what do you feel like was holding you back? Uh, I would say having other people to, to do this thing with. When you're, when you're a drummer, you need a band. You need to be playing with other people. Um, so get out there and find those other people. Um, get put bands together. So often, you do often find that drummers are the ones who start bands. Right. Yeah. And if you've got a PA, then you can be the singer in the band, right? <laughs> and if you've got a van, oh, hang on, <laughs> a singer with a PA, that would involve the singer lifting the PA. That's never <laughs> happened in my experience. Well, our Sorry, singer, singers, but you know it's true. Our singer, and I'm talking about you, Chris, you know who you are. Um, he was, he didn't do a lot of lifting, but in, in all honesty, he was out there networking pre and post show. And he is the one who booked the gig. So I got to give him credit for that. <laughs> um, all right. So now how about some of the best advice you remember receiving? Um, you only get better at it from doing it. It's all, it's all very well talking about it and thinking about it, but you have to do it. And when you first do it, you probably will suck at it. <laughs> so do it some more and get better at it. That's not just music or recording. That's everything. Yeah. Um, I have nearly three-year-old children, um, and my daughter gets very upset when she can't do something first go. Um, she's ever so much like her dad. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that, that's a, it's a life lesson. It's something you, you need to learn. You will not be Jimi Hendrix or you know fill in your music icon you will not be that good the day you pick up the instrument. So what's, if you were, what's a trip to me is to think that um, for your kids, within only four years, they're already going to be playing an instrument. And that's pretty remarkable if they follow uh, in your footsteps. And within five years, they'll be on a paid gig. That'll be quite scary. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so I think they call that child labor these days. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, one other thought, a takeaway from your best advice is just a reminder that um, that first thing that we do that's not so good, uh, don't be confused. It's absolutely okay and encouraged to potentially even love that work that you did more than when you make your very best work down the road. That is the funny conundrum of this stuff is like, you the first things you do which might not be so good you could just be so proud of and you could have so much fun doing it and you know i remember listening back to some of the first recordings and yeah i cringed at the mistakes i made but boy was i excited to hear our band played back off of a cassette tape you know yeah i, I i've um watched 
we were having a bit of a review session on some of the, some of our older videos, and you know, looking at what's good, what's bad, what worked, what didn't. And I look back at the, some of the production values of that stuff, and I go, "Oh my god!" And this is only seven years ago. It's not. It's not that long. Watching some of those videos and go, "Okay, so I didn't have any lights then." Yeah, glad, right. glad I got some lights. I didn't have this then. Yeah, I kind of. I'm I'm talking into a SM57 that's kind of blocking my face. Um, you you learn from this stuff. Yes, you're allowed to think this is great. You're allowed to enjoy it, but you learn from it because that's what we do. That. The day I always said the day I did the perfect gig is the day I quit the band. Right. Um, all right. So now let me I jump to the next question. Uh, a recording tip, hack, or secret sauce. Share something that the rock stars can use on their next session today, if you can think of one. Commit, 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 commit. <laughs> Wait, are you and, sure? And are you sure again. about that? <laughs> if, if it doesn't work. There's a fair chance you'll want to change it anyway before you get to the point where you can't go back and change it. So j just just commit it. Just have the courage of your convictions. Don't don't try and second guess yourself because I spent years doing it and it sucks. Yeah. All right. So uh, one thing that means is rock stars uh, commit to the performance, but it also means you know like commit to the sounds. Don't ask if you should record your guitar dry and add the reverb later just put the reverb on there now if you can yeah all those sort of things but i mean even uh, you know if you if you think that note's wrong change it if you're gonna if you have the courage of your convictions that note in that solo is what i meant to play go with it yeah all right so um how about sharing with us a uh either a favorite hardware tool or just something you're excited about right now my console my console is is just the best it's the best thing for my my recording workflow Wait, um, tell us what your console is one more time it's an audient asp 8024 heritage edition um i was introduced to it by the guys at audient i made some videos with them and i went okay i need this in my life um it is for the for me and the way i work um it is just the best thing ever. Yes, it's a it's a very expensive. Some people some people called it a very expensive mouse mat because sometimes I'm just steering a mouse across it. But it when when it's in full swing, when I've got a band in or I'm tracking something or I've got my band in tracking, it you know it's the speed. It, it's, you're not reaching for a mouse. You're not reaching for a controller that might have 15 different options on it. You just go bang, change, go. Yeah, yeah. It, it's awesome. All right. Um, now, but how about a favorite? Software tool or something you're excited about right now? RX. I just hope RX has saved my you know what more times than I care to mention. Yeah. Um it is just one of those it's a magic get out of jail free card. <laughs> yeah, um, it is. Cause cause we do mess up as as good as we are. Sometimes you'll get halfway through a, a recording and you'll go, Oh, but that moment of genius was so that you know, you're never going to capture that moment. So you have to repair it. And tools like RX are the way forward. Um, can you think of a couple of RX tricks that are unusual that you use it for? Um, or is it mostly just like using it for the most, you know, uh, intended uses is just still mind blowing, which it is. I mean, I, I actually, I discovered RX back at rx1 because at the time avid in the uk were distributing it for um for isotope and we could get a staff discount copy for about 20 dollars. and i went i'm gonna try that and i remember one of the demo files there was um it was a live jazz recording and someone dropped a glass in the background audio and you could see that glass and you could click on it draw around it and just delete that out of the audio and i went that's voodoo. That is yeah. proper audio witchcraft. Um, and I don't very often these days go in at, at that level because the plug, the integrated plugins within Pro Tools are so good now. Yeah. But I, I have had the, I, I did I do a recording, a, a live choral recording and with, with a real audience and real audiences make real noise, um, as did the three month old baby in the third row. Oh wow! And we were able to get rid of quite a lot of, you know, fairly full-on crying. I just did that. Uh, um, mixing a record, the artist went and recorded a chorus 
uh, in another space and there's all this, you know, we had to gain up a lot of things too. And there's all this foot shuffling and, you know, other noises and he brought it in and it was amazing. I was able to just go through and, uh, you know, remove these sounds and clean it up. And the, the real remarkable thing is I was able to do it without breaking RX out every day and being, you know, a ninja at this stuff that you really can like, yeah, I think the first time you look at it, you're like, what do I do with this? And then you, you, you know, once you understand how to draw the little box and hit the little apply button, you go, oh, oh that's yeah, pretty it, cool. It's, it's, it's proper voodoo. It really is magical when it works. Um, one last takeaway to um, Larry Crane of Tape Op. One of his tips was also using RX. And he talked about using the, the feature where it'll fly it from Pro Tools over to RX, you can treat it, and then it flies it back. Um, and he was using it for EQ stuff. So if there was like a resonant frequency in a sound, he'd fly it over there and he'd kind of paint out that certain zone of the frequency range, and it would take out fundamentals and stuff in a really cool way. So I haven't tried that, but I, I was very intrigued by that idea. Yeah, I, I mean, Mike, our, our editor on the Production Expert sites, uh, is, well, he, he's worked with uh, Isotope and he is sort of commonly known in the industry as Mr. R Exit. Um, my my actual use of that sort of thing is, is very light, really. It, it, if I'm having to fix something that is irretrievable, then I will go into that level of, you know, diving in at ninja level. Normally, I, I'll, I'd rather re-record it because it it's it's less complicated it's it's putting less levels of pain in my way before i can actually produce a a, a product for somebody um it is all about the end product it's all about it if your client goes away and they are beaming from ear to ear and and singing your praises you've done a good job whether you like what you did i've had clients where they, they've been so insistent on turning up you know, the the Hammond, for example, and I've got, that's just too loud. It's too loud. There's just too much of it. But this particular client went away absolutely ecstatic because she got the mix she wanted. Yeah. There's, there's, when, when, you're, when you're in the producer's chair, it's a very different chair to when you're the engineer and you're, you're being a service industry. When you're being creative, that's one thing. When you're a service, that's quite another. Yeah, indeed. All right, so um, next question, uh, resource for the business side or advice for the business side of this. If the rock stars want to do this for more than just a hobby, um, what tips do you have for them there or what resource do you want to tell them about? Um, if you're going to do this for money, use professional services. And by that, I mean don't use freebies. So if you're going to transfer files to someone, use the paid for version of Dropbox. It's 10 bucks a month or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you're going to use any another file transfer process, like we transfer, for example, use the paid for one. Uh, if your clients are worth that investment, it's not a lot of dough, um, but... If you're not paying for something, how can you complain about it? How can you say to if there's a problem with drop Dropbox, I can go to them and say, look, I pay my subscription, yada yada yada, fix it. Whereas if I if I'm just blagging it on the free one, I can't really legitimately. I know I can, but there's something in my head that says, look, I'm using this for a professional purpose. I should be paying. Therefore, I can complain. Yeah. If I'm just blagging it on the freebie. I can't really complain because, hey, I've had a good run. Okay. Um, now, both those tools are also kind of organizational tools, but what else would you like to share with the Rockstars about um, any tips or, you know, online resources for being organized and keeping all your shit together? Oh, I'm the worst person in the world for this one. <laughs> great. Hopefully um, you'll have a great tip then. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd, love to, I'd love to say I do. Um I see. I could come up with all the all the the really important stuff like don't spend more money on gear, more money on gear than you actually have, um, and don't get yourself into debt over gear and all those sort of things. But then I'd be in the case of do as I say, not as I do. I'm terrible. If I see the next thing that I think is going to improve my my workflow, I will buy it. Mm -hmm. I will put it on the little plastic card. It's very naughty, and I know I shouldn't, but I will. 
um, it brings me pleasure. I mean, um, I'm a great believer in the Marie Kondo kind of principle. And anyone who's not heard of her has obviously missed her Netflix show. Um, things, things around you should bring you pleasure. And I, and I think my, my studio brings me a great deal of pleasure. Yeah. And if putting the next piece of kit to fill an empty rack space, because empty rack spaces are the, the spawn of the devil, quite frankly, um, you know, that's, that's what the Never Never card is for. I, I'm joking, of course, a little bit. But, you know, credit's a good thing. So that, that, managed, that, managed credit is a good thing. That, again, that's, that's more of like a business or a financial tip too. But um, as far as anything organizational, do you have any tools that just help you stay organized in the studio? So, you know, you know not losing files or you have an easy communication or any of that kind of stuff? Um, I have a QNAP backup system what's which that actually uh it's basically a, a nas but it's a nas that is a computer it's a, a very basic windows machine with 12 terabytes of drives that sits underneath the coffee table in in my living room next to the the network port in the house okay um uh, it's basically it's, it's my off-site backup and every night it sits there and looks across the drives and goes yeah we'll back that up so, so um, this is, I love hearing this and actually give us some more insight into how a system like this works. You have a studio computer, you have drives yeah. on the studio computer. Do you use sort of external drives or internal drives for the studio computer? I have four internal, this is where it gets incredibly confusing. You can't do <laughs> this on a Mac, that's for sure. I have four internal, very large, four or six terabyte spinning rust drives okay 3.5 right. old, old school drives and so so audio is getting recorded to that and no, it's, it's, it's way more complicated uh, all right, all right. um on the in a front kind of a if i call it a drive slot do you know what i mean a kind mm -hmm. of like one of those sort of half inch and a half high by the width of the computer wide um i have a four slot caddy for two and a half inch ssds and i can have four of those running simultaneously um, they are my scratch drives, if you like. Mm -hmm. they're, they're the ones with active projects on. So um, audio and video gets recorded, stored to them, worked on on SSD. Then manually, it is, it is, when, when that project is finished, it's manually dumped onto one of the bigger um, spinning drives, rotational drives. Mm -hmm. The SSDs and the rotational drives every night get backed up via the QNAP system onto the local system in the house. I then also have them synced to Dropbox. All the active stuff is synced to Dropbox. So it's going up to the cloud every night as well. All right. So um, I love hearing this stuff. And did I mention that yet? <laughs> so the, uh, <laughs> the QNAP system, does that use like an Ethernet cable to create a yeah, network yeah. between the computers? So that might be something I would do here as well. I mean, I, I also have a studio and then a house and the idea of having, you know, a networked backup like that is pretty exciting. And when you talk about having the active projects synced to Dropbox, is there a clever way to do that? Or is it as simple as those projects just live in the Dropbox folder while you work on them? So therefore they're synced or is it, is they it live in the, yeah, they live in the Dropbox folder. Okay, cool. Um, and that way I can access them on more than one machine as well. Yeah, I, I do that. Which is really handy. For, I find that really useful for podcast production because uh, yeah. I want to be, whatever computer I'm on, I just want to be able to open the file, work on it, find that thing, share it, you know, any of that stuff. All right, cool. Well, let's let's do our closing question, James. Um, and, and of course, I just want to say thank you again for joining us on the show. This is totally a blast to hang out with you. Um, well, thank you for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, it's a pleasure. And, and I've had two interviews today, uh, both of them over the Great Pond to England. So that's been pretty cool. <laughs> I don't know how it ended up that way, but it did. Um, we're going to take a, uh, this is a hypothetical question. We're going to take the Wayback Studio machine. You're going to go back, find young James, um, who hmm. I guess if you go too far back, you're, you know, young James is seven and you just might scare the shit out of yourself showing up, <laughs> <laughs> assuming maybe you're a little older than that. Uh, you go back, you say, look, dude, you know, here you are messing around with this recording stuff on the, and the task game. And I know you want to be a rock star of the recording studio yourself one day. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio. What advice would you go back and give yourself if you could? Uh, oh, I 
it's it's so hard, isn't it? But I think <laughs> that's your it advice. Was actu- <laughs> yeah, it was it was actually a piece of advice I was genuinely given by my late stepfather, and that was knowing everything is not important. Knowing where to find out that's the important bit. Oh man! Um, and bear in mind, this was this was before before the interwebs and before Google and before you know, Alta Vista and Yahoo and Netscape, you know. Um, and there are plenty of people out there who are going, what the heck is he talking about? Right. <laughs> um, so we, we had these things called libraries and uh, these paper things called books and magazines. And there are a few of those still around. That's where we found out stuff. Um, and I think, again, the, another another thing that I was by, by the same person was never be afraid to ask there's no such thing as a stupid question just a stupid answer um, and th- those are normally given by me <laughs> but just ask Pe- people don't mind people asking um, if you don't understand something um, ask yeah. if you're in if you're in that training course or you're I, I'm the, I'm the annoying one in train co- training courses I'm the one sat at the front asking questions and I guarantee the person at the back's going, thank goodness he asked that question because I was really worried yeah. about that. Usually when I hear somebody else ask a question, I, I feel the same thing, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm the one at the front being annoying and everyone's going, oh, oh thank, just get on with it. <laughs> Whereas actually they're probably going, oh, I'm glad he asked that. So Rockstars, I'm going to remind you that um, there's a link to all the, uh, many of the videos from James, including his music, uh, from James, AKA Jivey, uh, from, uh, on YouTube. So I put a YouTube playlist here, there while you're there, um, you know, make sure to subscribe and hit the like button and share away and hit that notification bell. So you don't miss anything from us. But then also you, if you're listening to this podcast episode right now on YouTube, um, and if you're not, you could go find it there. That's actually a great place to drop in comments and questions. So if you have any questions for James or I, go drop them in there and we will be sure to uh, to catch catch them. Uh, I will for sure. And if James needs to give you an answer, I'll, I'll forward it on or something. But yeah, uh, if I can help in any way, I will do. Yeah. And then, um, James, let the rock stars know how they can find you online. Uh, go follow your videos, learn everything they ever wanted to know about the studio and keep up with you. Okay, so the location recordings thing is www. Oh, you don't have to say that anymore, do you? Because it's so old school. Uh, <laughs> locationrecordings.co.uk, location recordings with an S.co.uk. Um, and you can find me pretty much all over the production expert sites, which is www.pro tools expert.com. Right on, man. Well, thank you again for being here on Recording Studio Rockstar. It was a total blast to hang out with you. Um, I guess one last closing question. Uh, we talk, I, I've run into you and we see each other occasionally at conferences like Winter NAM out in Am- Anaheim, California in January. And I know we have Summer NAM coming up here in Nashville. Are there any more um, conferences that we just want to let the rock stars know about that are really cool that are happening in different parts of the world that they should be attending? Um, I think one up and coming show is actually this weekend um, in Berlin, and that's the Super Booth. Um, it's a trade show, but it's it's kind of it's a bit more than that. It's very synthy at the moment, but a lot of the companies who are in who used to do music Messer in Frankfurt, um, I'm 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 not going to you know cast nasturtiums and say that Messer is dying, but you know it's not the show it used to be, whereas. Superbooth is really an up up and coming show. There's a lot of cool stuff. It's say it's very synthy at the moment, but I think it's only going to grow and get bigger. So check that one out. Um, cool. I, I think say California Anaheim um, for Winter Nam is is the trade show in the world these days. So um, I've already booked my flights, and I know it's only um, beginning of May, but I've already booked my flight for January. So I look forward to seeing you there. Right on, man. And I will be going to, uh, hopefully I'll be going to AES in New York in October. And that's another really fun event too. And I think that's just open to the public. Do you know if that's accurate? Yeah, I believe it is. You can get you can get a public ticket. Um, some of the events and the seminars and things are paid for separately. And some of them are quite expensive. But um, there, there used to be an AES event in London and it was not so great. But AES New York is, is very, very cool. I've yeah. not been... 
Uh, we normally send one of the team, but it wasn't my turn this year. And I think I think you mentioned um, uh, mix with the masters uh, attending that and going actually to the to the whole week long event. But uh, yeah. rock stars at at many of these like Nam and AES, um, you'll see a mix with the masters booth there, and it's pretty wild to be able to sit there and listen to these different um, masters get up there and just give you little, little miniature classes and talk about mixing. So uh, it's there. These are fun events to go to. I highly recommend them if you can. And I'll be there for sure, shooting some video and, and running into you, James, or or whoever else is there. So um, well, thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, man. Thank you, dude. Great to hang out with you. And we'll hopefully see you around uh, the studio or the next whatever event we're going to. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. Also, remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with these weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free mixing course at mixmasterbundle.com. Look for the link in the show notes. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio, all totally free. Thanks for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music.